Welcome to Ataxia 201 from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. I'm Sherry Marvel. I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. I study cognition and I focus on an area of the brain called the cerebellum. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. You certainly are welcome. I'm gonna start first by asking you to define just a little bit more some of the things that you just said. So you identified one of the brain areas that you focus on called the cerebellum. Talk to me about that. Okay, um, the cerebellum is an area of the brain. It sits at the very back of the brain. If you were to look at a brain, you'd see this big mound in the front and this little kind of broccoli or cauliflower formation in the back. Um, but uh, fun fact is the, that cerebellum has more neurons in it can, in a very condensed version than the rest of the brain combined. So it's a pretty important structure. Um, it's involved with movement. We know that. Um, and what it does is it helps coordinate movement and the timing of movement. So let's define cognition then. Okay. Now, cognition is the process, um, is a mental action or process of um, acquiring knowledge and understanding things. And this is through thought, experiences, through the senses. So it can include um, many processes such as holding information in, in mind over what we call short-term memory or um, scientists like to call it working memory. There's also uh, recalling information from the past, so long-term memories. Um, it can be paying attention, concentration, um, doing several things at once, something I refer to as multitasking. Um, language skills such as word finding or understanding what someone's saying to you, that's part of language. Problem solving, planning, Etc. Those are something known as executive function. Those are all cognitive processes. So since we're here in the ataxia series, maybe we could talk mm -hmm. about this intersection between these three things, the cerebellum, cognition, and ataxia or difficulty walking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the cerebellum, as I said, it's a motor structure, meaning it has a very um, important role in movement, um, and which is um, helping to coordinate the movement, helping with the fine timing of movements, less than a second, well under a second. And so what that means is, you know, the movements are smooth, they're fluid, uh, they're, you know, they're just, they're sequenced in the right order. We think that the cerebellum, and I say, we think that the cerebellum plays a similar role in cognition. So we're trying to understand what it does in cognition. We think it helps with the timing and the sequencing of thoughts much the same way it helps with the timing and sequencing of movement. For ataxia, people with ataxia, uh, the cerebellum is often affected, whether it's through stroke, through a virus, through um, a, a tumor, a tumor that's resected, and, and also through what we call cerebellar degeneration. That means the neurons are dying off in the cerebellum over time. So, that leads to movement disorders, trouble walking, um, balance, holding their balance, trouble speaking, dysarthria, it, it's called. So they may have slurred speech and stuff because the coordination of their movements, whether it's their legs, their core, um, you know, for balance, their, their mouth, tongue muscles for speech, they all um, get out of sequence. And so we know the cerebellum is involved in movement it affects motor function. In people with ataxia, when the cerebellum is affected, it can also affect cognition in the same way. That's how all the triangle is connected. Thank you for that. So let's talk about what you mean when you say cognitive impairment. Hmm. Okay. Well, let me talk about how first how we define a cognitive impairment. So we give people tests. That's a good way to just assess someone's cognitive level. So it could be a test of attention, a test of executive function, a test of language, a test of short-term memory. These tests have been developed over the years and they've been given to thousands of people. And based on people's age and education level, we can predict where someone should be if they're you know, healthy. You know, a normal function person on this test who's you know, 56 with a college degree should get you know, this score with a range. If you're at well outside of that range, something like we call standard deviation, several standard deviations outside of that range, we say you might be 
impaired if you fall below it. You could also fall several st standard deviations above that range if you're, you know, super a person. So when someone falls below a range, we have to take into account their age and education because that really matters on these tests. And we say, oh, they're, they've got an impairment in that, whatever that test is, test, you know, attention or maybe a working memory deficit, a short-term memory deficit. So the caveat is that we don't have great tests for cerebellar cognitive function. We have some tests that are begin coming out that people are developing thinking this is something that assesses cognitive, cerebellar cognitive function, but it's such a new area in medical research that we don't have what we call standardized norms, meaning we haven't tested hundreds or thousands of people on this test across you know, all the ages and education levels to know what's n normal. So that's a little bit more difficult to assess. And that's where um, people like me come in because I, we're doing what we call experimental design. We actually are creating tests that we think are tapping into cerebellar cognitive function so that we can test people with ataxia to see how they're doing. And what we do is we try to find uh, healthy people to take the same test, but it's a much smaller number. It might be like 25 people, not thousands, right? And so we try to see, and they're, they're pretty well matched on age and education to the group with ataxia. And you know, little by little, we're trying to understand how people with ataxia think and where their impairments, if we want to call them that, you know, how they might fall short from someone who doesn't have ataxia. And that helps us understand how the cerebellum is um, helping with the thought coordination. And ultimately, the goal is to try to intervene there so we can come up with workarounds you know, to help with that. And what cognitive changes are a part of ataxia? Mm -hmm. They can have trouble, um, multitasking is a big one for people, they'll say that. They'll say that they have trouble concentrating. With a, now that they have a taxi, they have a hard time just focusing. Um, there, it's hard to switch attention from one task to the other. If someone's watching TV and their spouse comes in and tries to get their attention, they might have trouble shifting away. Um, they might have trouble um, in social situations, following if a couple people are talking at once at a party or something, just kind of following the conversations. Um, they may ruminate on the same topics over and over. Um, they might. A, a, complaint that we hear a lot is word finding. People have trouble. Now, th this is also an effect of aging, but above and beyond aging, people have complained that they just can't find the word that they want. So that makes it difficult to express, you know, what they want to say or their thoughts. And does everyone with ataxia experience these cognition problems? Um, to a certain degree, they will. Most, most people will see something affected, some aspect of, of those things affected. The, it, the, the issue is that it var I hate to give a, a pat answer, it varies. It varies according to how old someone is. It, it varies according to what caused the ataxia. So um, if it's cerebellar degeneration, it tends to be progressive and gradual because the neurons those are the cells that make up the cerebellum. They're dying off gradually over time and it keeps kind of going and going. It's a chronic issue for most people who have it. They're gonna see cognitive problems. They may experience cognitive problems early, you know, at some point and they can work around it. You know, they can, they're, especially, you know, people are really high functioning. They find, they're sneaky. They can find ways to, to get around, let's say, not being able to find the right word. They use another, right? Let's just say um, they're having issues uh, multitasking. They start doing one thing at a time, or instead of doing four things, they do two things at a time, you know. Um, but over time, they'll understand that gets harder and harder. But if you have a stroke, for example, you might have immediate problems that actually start to get better over time. Um, virus, you know, as as the body recovers from that, they might actually regain some of the difficulties, uh, overcome some of those difficulties and regain function. What's the rate at which people can expect these changes to be taking mm. place? Yeah, so um, that's a good one. Again, it, it depends on um, the, the what caused it, right? So if it's, uh, if it's the degeneration, it's slow, it's gradual, but even within that, some people have something called spinocerebellar ataxia. So they might have type six, for example. Six occurs late in life. 
It's really gradual, it's subtle, it's slow. Um, other cerebellar subtypes might be a little bit, you know, come on earlier in life. They might be a little bit more aggressive. So people there might see a, a faster cognitive kind of um, impairments that they notice. It seems like some of the subtypes that you mentioned, if they impact on people earlier in life, they could have a pretty profound effect on someone's job, for example, or even their mm -hmm. everyday activities. That's right. So people sometimes are, people often are affected by their job when they have ataxia because of movement problems, right? So a lot of the, you know, if you're more on the laboring end, if you're a mail carrier, for example, and have ataxia, you're gonna have a very difficult time walking house to house to house, right? So they might need to get reassigned, for example. Um, even a desk job, there's a lot of typing, phones, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but the cognitive stuff can come into play. So people may have um, problems multitasking, as we talked about, like, so if they're trying to enter something onto the computer, motor problems aside, and they're talking to someone, that, that might become very difficult for them to keep track of what they're doing. Um, concentration can be a problem. So uh, if, you're, if, you, if you're in your office and there's a lot of conversations going on outside your door, and that can be pretty distracting for someone with ataxia. So those sorts of things can affect the job. Um, it, but I think the movement stuff is more, you know, kind of outweighs that and people address the movement stuff. You know, if you if you have trouble multitasking, you do one thing at a time. That, that would be one suggestion. I won't make any others because that's not my role. But um, there are ways to to I think if it, once you get the movement uh, problems under control at your job, the cognitive issues can usually be um, addressed. How about in everyday activities? Mm. So household duties can be affected, like you know, paying bills, balancing your checkbook, or um, if you need to make plans, or planning a trip, or creating a grocery list. Like anything that would require a lot of cognitive function could get affected. Um, and you know, one thing we didn't talk much about, but people can become um, more impulsive with ataxia, and that can affect how you interact with others. So. Uh, um, maybe saying something without thinking first, and you know that can affect your relationships. So that can affect sort of your home life a little bit. Um, and people can just you know feel a little bit more overwhelmed in general when they have these uh, cognitive issues that are affecting just everyday functions at home. How often do people who have these cognition issues also develop dementia? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, people, um, patients will ask about this because they're very concerned about it, and rightfully so. But, um, you know, dementia is not something that we typically see with ataxia. It, that's a very severe memory loss. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we don't typically think of frank memory problems as part of ataxia. Dementia is really something else altogether. Um, and the cerebellum does not, the loss of cerebellar you know, cells, neurons does not lead to dementia, based on what we know today. <laughs> I'll leave that caveat there. People can develop dementia with ataxia just like anybody can develop dementia with, with or without any other disorder. You've offered some glimmers of hope. Mm -hmm. And tell me more mm -hmm. about what can be done with pe mm -hmm. in people with ataxia with cognitive impairment. All right, so um, it's important to treat holistically so the, the one neurologist said to me once, uh, whatever is good for your brain, um, whatever is good for your heart is good for your brain. <laughs> I don't want to mess that up. So anything that you can do to increase your heart health will help your brain. And there, uh, therefore, exercise is pretty important. And that's important for a tax. I'm sure the physical therapy people talked about, we'll talk about that as well. Um, exercise is, is really important, not just for your, your muscle strength and, and your heart health, but for your brain as well. So there are many aspects of a taxi that would affect cognition and, and your exercising and your physical health is one of them. Um, also would be just staying engaged. So doing, everybody's heard this before, do crossword puzzles, do, um, if you can do it, jigsaw puzzles, um, you know, even, uh, you know, talking to friends, if you, you know, I know the speech issues can become a social problem, but if you can manage it, just being socially interactive, 
Um, and uh, even video games, as long as you're thinking. I mean, what you don't want to do is sit on the couch and halfway watch a, a show that you're not really interested in, like get up and move or be thinking um, something that engages you mentally. Um, also, uh, we didn't talk much about the, the, mood, the changes in mood that can come with ataxia. We talked a little bit about impulsivity, but um, you know, we, we've found that over 90 95% of people with ataxia have some aspect of mood change and depression and anxiety are the highest and most common. So getting, and those can affect cognition. So getting your mood treated um, is a big, uh, is one big important way to keep your cognition intact with ataxia. And also just sort of the basic care of like vision and, and hearing. Because some people get, um, you know, double vision, they have problems with eye movement, so that affects their vision, that's gonna affect reading and that sorts of thing. Those sorts of things definitely impact cognition. What's your vision for the future with regard to this? You clearly are doing lots of research yeah. on this. Well, I mean, our goal is to help the patients, right? So the way, so that's that's the end goal. So working backwards, we from there, we need to understand more about how the cerebellum is working, how it's um, affecting cognition, so that we can develop interventions, whether it's pharmacological, brain stimulation. Um, you know, those sorts of things can help get, and, 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 and at home exercises. Those would be the things that we'd want to know more about, get a better understanding of, so that people, so that we can help people with their cognitive impairments that they may find, or even just their difficulties. It may not be an impairment as defined by two standard deviations below the mean, but people might say, I, I know I'm supposed to be here, and I'm here. I want to get back to where I used to be aging aside. So that's um, that's where we want our research. That's the future, is to be able to come up with ways to help people improve and maintain their cognition with the ataxia. Thanks for joining us on Ataxia 201 from Johns Hopkins Medicine. If you feel like you'd like to be evaluated here at Johns Hopkins for your ataxia, please see the contact information at the bottom of your screen.